Thank you all for being here. Um, we have a, a great guest today. We have AJ Edelman. Uh, AJ is a four-time Israeli national champion in the skeleton event, and you represented Israel in the 2018 Winter Olympics. I did, yeah. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having so. me. I finally get the, uh, the interview at Google that I never got before. So. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. You grew up in Boston. I did. You grew up playing hockey starting at three years old. Yeah. So you've been on the ice. You've been involved in athletics. What was childhood like being a, an athlete in, a, in the sport? Um, well, I started at age three. I started really young because my parents, uh, they believed in giving uh, my two brothers and myself the opportunity to have an active lifestyle if we chose. So getting on the ice in Boston was very, very accessible. I got on the ice at age three, and I thought to myself at the time that this is probably the first time I ever thought in an engineering kind of way, but that the expected value of playing time for a goalie was a full game. Yeah. So that was one right there. But the expected value for somebody who is a defenseman or a center was probably like a quarter of a game. So it was a far better value proposition to become a goalie. So I decided to become a goalie and played, uh, played in net for the next 20 plus years and uh, sports shaped a good deal of how I viewed the world and taught me a lot of good lessons. So you played growing up, you played at MIT when you went to college. I did. Did you, um, did you kind of always know that you wanted to stay in sports and be an athlete or was this just you know, a, a fun thing growing up and a hobby? Originally it started out, it kind of ebbed and flowed. So it started as a serious, a serious endeavor and around eighth grade I had the opportunity to kind of take it to the next level. I had uh, some scholarship opportunities for prep schools. If that's the route that you want to go to take to get to a D1 level uh, level playing. And I thought to myself, well, that's just not what people from my back, I'm, I'm a religious Jew. So I thought it's really not what people from my background generally do. Like I probably should just stick to uh, more academic pursuits and, and not pursue that. And so it kind of ebbed away where it became far less serious. Uh, and then later on when I was, uh, during a year off in Israel when I was 19, I decided to rededicate myself to athletics. And so you took some time off from the athletics, and you graduate, and you move out to San Francisco, and you start working at Oracle. How did you, you know, you have a promising tech career. How did you decide that being an Olympian was going to be your goal? So it's an interesting story, but I decided actually in 2013, uh, when I was in my senior year at MIT that I wanted to be an Olympian. But how I got there was more a process of wanting to accomplish something great. And it's a mindset that I've had since childhood. When I, was, um, when I was at age 10, I moved to a new school, and I was the odd kid out. I experienced a lot of bullying when I was at that school. And it really left a lot of, um, a lot of scarring. But it, when I was there, one of the ways that I coped with uh, the difficulties was that I thought that in 20 years, 30 years, None of this would matter. None of that time period would matter. And what would matter is what I accomplished out of life. And so I thought every day when I'd experience all this d trouble that in 35 years, 30 years, 20 years, I'm going to stand on top of a mountain. I didn't know yet that it was actually going to be a mountain. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but I was going to stand on top of a mountain having accomplished some pretty good things, having left my mark on the world. So over the course of you know, the 17 years since then, uh, when I've faced certain challenges, that essence of be the best, accomplish something great has come out. So it, it happened three distinct times in my life. The first was in my teenage years when I was extremely academically unmotivated. And I decided to make a shift of trying to get into MIT. I was like, well, right now you're unmotivated, make a goal. I tried to get into MIT. That was the level of excellence that I thought of going to an engineering school that I wanted to go to. So I got into MIT. The second was, is when I was, it, um, when I was in a gap year in Israel 19, I had let myself go from a physical standpoint. I had reached about 200 plus pounds. I, was thinking, I think I tipped the scale one day at 203 pounds. And I looked down. I couldn't see my toes one day. And I thought, well, is this, is this like, is it, where did that kid go? that said he was going to be the best of the best. Like, is this the best version of you that you can be? Is this, is this what you really want? And so at that point, I wasn't thinking about hockey anymore. I wasn't thinking about sports. But I said, you know, the way to deal with, with what you're dealing with right now is become an athlete again. But don't just become an athlete. Be a great athlete. 
And so I took a deep dive on everything that I could learn about health and fitness. Lost 35 pounds in three months and decided to try to make the MIT hockey team. Made the MIT hockey team and then for the next few years played at MIT. But as I came to an end of my hockey career at MIT, I was faced with, well, what do I do next? Do I, and if I'm going to continue in sport, it has to be something that if I'm going to sacrifice the next few years of my life, it has to have an actual impact. If it's, it can't just be great for you, it has to be great for the world, mm -hmm. right? It, you know, it has to have some kind of, of impact that people will look back and say that happened. And so one night I'm sitting, I don't know if any of you guys are aware, but there's a dorm at MIT called Burton Connor. I was sitting in the Burton Connor uh, suite lounge of my dorm. And the news came on, the 11 o'clock news. On that news segment was the US team trials for Sochi. And so I saw the bobsled team going, and I thought, oh, that looks amazing. The bobsled looks intense. Like, I'm, I'm in the gym all day. I could push heavy things. I'm pretty good with my hands and hand-eye coordination. Like, I, I'll do that. And being an Olympian would allow me to speak with some authority on sports. And one of my passions is getting more young Jewish kids involved in sports to have those resources available to them that you know, may not be available to them now, that they can know that they can be, sports is a good outlet for them. So I thought, all right, so I'm going to become an Olympian. I'm going to become a very proud Israeli Olympian. So was it the gap year that you decided you wanted to become an Israeli citizen? And what was that process like for you? No, the, the, in the year of 2006, I went to, MI, uh, sorry, I went to, to Israel on a, um, on a summer tour. But that summer, we were supposed to travel with this group north and south across Israel visiting all these sites. But the second Lebanon war abruptly broke out while I was there. And we had to shelter in place, so to speak, in Jerusalem for a long while. There was rockets coming over the border every day. And whether it was, I think it really was the connections I made during that time. And just seeing the Israeli society as they came under attack, that I formed an immense connection, like a very intense connection, deep connection to the land of Israel. And I thought, you know, one day I'm going to be an Israeli citizen. I want to be part of this society. And that was when I decided in 2006 that one day, eventually, I'd be Israeli. And how did you, when did you become an Israeli citizen? I officially became Israeli in 2016. 2016? Yes. OK. Um, I want to talk a little bit about skeleton. Sure. But I don't know if everyone here who's going to see this knows what that is. Sure. So can you explain the sport and what it's like to experience that thrill? Sure. So many people have seen the movie Cool Runnings. And that's generally, skeleton athletes are, we kind of have a bit of a complex. Because everybody knows bobsled and everybody knows Cool Runnings. So we usually start out our conversation with, well, do you guys know Cool Runnings? <laughs> and everybody will nod their head yes. And they say, well, do you know that there's another sport called skeleton? They say, no. Mm -hmm. uh, so bobsled is where the, the vehicle being driven down the track is the bullet. They said, let's take a vehicle, let's drive it as quick as possible down a mile-long track, reach speeds of 90 miles an hour, and somebody steers with their hands. Skeleton was, they said, let's make the human the bullet. We'll put him on his stomach, and he'll steer with his head. And so that's what skeleton is. You start from a dead sprint. You have a 70-pound sled. You put it on the ice. You sprint about 30 meters down a hill. You dive forward onto it. And then you navigate over, over a mile-long track under five g-forces. Uh, towards the end. And whoever reaches the bottom in the quickest time in one piece is the victor. So, so I think that's a very kind of crazy and interesting piece to that, is that you grew up playing goalie, right. so you weren't sprinting. Um, you you know, never really participated in the sport. How did you decide that this was going to be the one that you were going to be an Olympian in? Uh, so as I mentioned, bobsled was, bobsled was really the passion sport of mine that I saw. I, I saw Bob said, I said, you know, I want to do bobsled. So I messaged, I Googled, you know, is there an Israeli bobsled team? It turned out that there had been, but it had, uh, they had kind of hung up their spikes, so to speak, after the 2006, after trying to qualify for the 2006 games. But I found their website, I messaged them, I said, hey, I'm this kid, I'm in Boston, I'm about to graduate from MIT, I really want to do bobsled for Israel, I really want to start an Israeli bobsled team. And so they messaged back, and they said, listen, um, 
nobody wants to do this sport from Israel, and nobody, you know, you have to get multiple people to do it with you. You can't just do it solo. Right, so your likely bet, the best bet for you is to do a solo sport called Skeleton. Go check it out. So YouTube Skeleton, I saw that looked pretty intense, and I went to try it in Lake Placid, New York. And when I tried it in Lake Placid, New York, they, there's a bobsled track that was used in the, um, in the Olympics back in the 80s. And you get to try it, but they pad you up like the Michelin Man. So you don't feel any pain at that point. If you hit a wall, it just feels like easy breezy, like skydiving. It's perfect. You only feel the pain later, but at that moment, I was just feeling like it was on a roller coaster with no seatbelts. So I was like, oh, this is great. I additionally tried speed skating, and speed skating I took to quite well, but skeleton for reasons that were, skeleton presented a bigger challenge, and so I decided to pursue skeleton. So I want to go into a little bit about how you train for this. There's only so many tracks in the world. Right. There's definitely none in Israel, I, I don't believe. There's one in the middle of the desert. So how did you learn to do this sport and you know, become good enough to qualify uh, at an Olympic level? Sure. Uh, it's in, there's a lot of moving parts to training for an Olympics. There's a lot of moving parts specifically for skeleton. Skeleton is broken down into the sprinting component and then the driving component. The driving component is physical skill with your brain and uh, hand-eye coordination and knowing how to manipulate yourself under five G-forces. So for reference, five G-forces, I was about 180 pounds when I competed on average. Five G-forces would feel like somebody put a 900-pound human being on my back abruptly when going through a turn. So under those heavy loads, you have to manipulate your shoulders and your knees to torque the sled. And it's an incredibly difficult thing to do because if you do it incorrectly by a few fractions of a second, you can drive yourself to the roof or down to the floor and you can severely, you can concuss yourself. So I decided that the number one way to become good at anything is by dedicating the entirety of your time to it and achieving 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. I was told originally that I was really bad at the sport, <laughs> like really uh, atrocious. I lacked all the skills necessary for doing it. The, the scouting report originally was that I lacked the tools necessary to become a competitive skeleton athlete, that I might be on a small scale developmentally competitive on a lower circuit, but would never achieve a measure of success in the sport itself. So that to me was a challenge. And the reason that they said that was because unknown to me at the time, when I entered a corner in those early training runs in Lake Placid, I would always kink my body to the right. And I didn't know why, but they said, you know, you should probably see a chiropractor for that. It's like, well, why? It wasn't until years later that I realized that I found out after we did a body scan that I had some scoliosis. The second aspect of it was that I couldn't sprint. I was an atrocious sprinter, and the sprinting is more than, it's more than one third of your run, essentially, because the compounded velocity. And so to overcome my deficit in the sprint, I thought I was just going to become the best driver that I could be. So 10,000 hours over four years is about eight hours a day for seven days a week for 365 days a year for four straight years. I had a job at the time at Oracle. I was doing, you know, I had, had a real life. So what I did was I left a video loop of YouTube on every day. I watched at least six to eight hours of World Cup footage of Skeleton. And then I would mentally visualize myself going down the tracks to create what are called neural pathways. The so neural pathways we have in our brains, they're highways of information. And the more you think about something, the quicker it is to make that connection. And so I would watch six to eight hours of these videos. I'd put myself on a skeleton set, I'd lie down, and I'd imagine myself going through the track six to eight hours a day every day for 365 days a year, over four years, I reached 10,000 hours. That was how I trained originally when I wasn't on the ice. When I was on the ice, I took three to four times the recommended run volume for a skeleton athlete. So a skeleton athlete is supposed to take two to three runs a day for head health reasons. I took about eight runs a day, seven runs a day. It takes a tremendous physical toll, but it also means that you can speed up that process of making those connections. And mm -hmm. I, I took to the sport um, because of that. Not very quickly, but I reached a level that I was looking to reach in a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you use virtual reality, I too, did. as part of that. How did that play into your training? Those mental runs that I was doing, at one point I thought there was a way to up that game. 
So I got myself an, uh, a gear headset for my phone. And I loaded up a point of view video in it. I would lie down on my sled and put the gear headset over my head. And just for an hour at a time, just watch a running loop of myself going down the skeleton track and then practicing the movements to familiarize myself with what I would do if I was in the track at various points in time. So you knew 10,000 hours was going to take four years. Yeah. And you started four years before the 2018 Olympics. Yes. When did you realize that you actually had a shot at making this Olympics, not the next Olympics? So, the, to put it all into context, really, the, the goal was to make the 2022 Olympic Games. So when I was told that I, was, that I lacked the components necessary to become a, a competitive skeleton athlete, I thought, well, it was my 23rd birthday. It was March 14th of 2014. I sat down in the cafeteria at the Lake Plaza Olympic Training Center, and I Googled how many days until the 2022 Olympic Games. It turned out that there were 2,884 days. So I sat down at the table, and I said, I wrote on a piece of paper, 2,884. I circled it. And I said that for 2,884 days, I wouldn't stop training. And if I didn't make the Olympic Games in 2022, only then could I stop that journey. In 2016, uh, it was an incredibly difficult year for me. But it was the first time that I participated in a World Championships. But after the World Championships, most people hang up their spikes for the season. They're, they're done. It occurs in mid-February, and they think that you know it's it's their last competition, they go home. But I thought, like, I have a mindset that if you're not training on Christmas, your opponents are. So I had a month to gain valuable experience on my opponents that they weren't taking. So I thought, well, where is the latest track open? Where's the, and, and it turned out that it would be Segolda, Latvia. It was open until March 16th of that year. So I had a month to go to Segolda. But I had no experience in Segolda, and Segolda turns out that it is the probably most physically punishing and dangerous track on tour. So I headed to Segolda, and every day, for three, four, five times a day, I'd run down, you know, I'd take my runs down the Segolda track. I broke an ankle while I was in Segolda. Like, it was incredibly, it was an incredibly painful time. It took a tremendous mental toll. On March 14th, it was two years after I'd made the 2,884 day commitment. But that day, I spent it alone at the bobsled track. Nobody was there, but I was working out late at night. And I just decided, like, I'd reached burnout point. So I decided, like, I'm just going to quit. It's, I'm finished. I'm done. So I was messaging Oracle at the time, who had given me a leave of absence. I was messaging them that I was going to come back a little early. But before I did that, I watched a commercial uh, that Procter & Gamble puts out. It's an amazing commercial. You guys should go YouTube it when this is done. It's called Thank You, Moms. It's a really powerful commercial that always moved me to, to tears because it, it goes through these kids from when they're extremely young and they're falling on their, on their butts and they're, they're, you know, it's a figure skater and she falls in competition. It just goes through their years. Their mom's always there on the sidelines. And then eventually it cuts out. And the next scene is the, um, is the Olympians going through. And then they point to their mom in the, the crowd and they you know, they're crying, and then I'm crying, and everybody's, you know, everybody's crying. So, um, yeah. so that to me was like, um, am I really going to quit? Like, am I, like, I should be that dude. So at that point, um, I messaged Oracle that I, was, that, I was, um, that I was going to leave them and pursue Skeleton as a full-time endeavor. And, uh, and that is when I made the commitment that it wasn't just going to be 2022, it was going to be 2018. Mm -hmm. So when did you qualify? And when did you know you were going to be the 2018 Olympics? Um, the qualification came down to the last two races. It was a really, um, the season was in severe doubt from the outset. From the beginning, the athlete is supposed to qualify the country, not himself. And so it works on a ranking system. If a skeleton athlete achieves a rank that is of certain ranking relative to his peers, then the country gets an invitation to go to the Olympic Games. And they can send who they want. And so from the, from the beginning of the season, we had myself and another potentially competitive skeleton athlete. And there were two circuits that we can compete on. One of the circuits traditionally provided a better points opportunity, a better ranking opportunity for which to get that invitation. 
the thing is, is that everybody took a look at the last cycle and said, OK, so that one's far better. So everybody's like, so we're all going to go to that one. So all of the competitive athletes went to that mid-level circuit, which I was training on. Nobody showed up to the lower level races. So there was an immediate option. What do we do? Do both Israeli athletes go to the lower level races, or do we go one to each race to cover our bases and hold the other athletes at the other race back from points while the other one accrues points? And so the team leadership aspect demanded that we split the time and that I, as Israel's number one, go to the more difficult competitions. So for the entirety of the season, I was actually down in points, not in a position to qualify for the games until the final two races. So the cutoff for qualifying for the Olympics was January 14th. The Olympics started on February 9th. The cutoff is January 14th. Everybody would know if they had kind of made it by January 16th. January 10th and 11th were the final two races in Lake Plas, and I went in not in the top Israeli position and not in a position to qualify for the games. The two races I needed to pull Israel's best results. Israel had only ever achieved one fifth place result in Placid. I needed to achieve two medal results for Israel. Top six are medal in skeleton because it's considered a, a, a very uh, difficult criteria to meet. And so in the final two races, I did pull two, two medals and qualified. We found out in January 16th that I had received the invite for the Olympic Games. So now you get, you're going to the Olympics. You're one of 10 athletes representing yeah. Israel. What was the opening ceremonies like? And then what was the event like? I mean, being on the biggest world stage. The, a lot of people ask what the Olympics in general is like. And I'd, I'd essentially say that the Olympics is, from an athlete's perspective, at least to me, was like a big summer camp. It's just a televised summer camp with lots of external drama for the TV viewers. But walking into the stadium was, I mean, you feel this, you know that it's a momentous occasion. You know that forever, when people look at the opening ceremonies for the 2018 games, they're going to see the Israeli delegation walk in, and you are one of those 10 athletes. It's a, a huge, it's not a weight, but it's, it just, you feel it. So walking into the stadium, it was a Friday night. And um, Friday night is Sabbath, and as uh, I wasn't uh, using my phone. And so I'm probably the only one in that stadium who wasn't videoing walking into the stadium. Everybody else is like walking in with a flag in one hand and a phone in the other hand. And so they were walking with both flags in both hands. But it was, it was just an incredible experience to, uh, to walk into that stadium. I can't, it's, it's indescribable the feeling that you have knowing that you are there for your country. And then how did the Olympics go for you? Uh, that's a bit more of a, of a nuanced question. The Olympics I treated as any other race. I was there to do a job, right? So the Olympics seem like a great big party, and in a way they are. Like they're a, f a big, a massively expensive, huge big party. But for me, as a skeleton athlete, I'm sent there by my country. The only reason I'm there is because I was given an invite by my country to go do a job on their behalf. And so I approached the race like any other race that I had. Spend all of my day working on the track. It was a new track, so I'd, I didn't have any notes on it. I didn't have a, a coach there um, who could help me out. And so it was just trying every day to work on how I could become better during my skeleton run. It was a difficult time because it seemed like there were all these distractions that you could uh, take part in. But and, and to some extent, I think that if I had gone if I, go to, if I were to ever go to another Olympics, that I'd make more of the distractions. Like, it, you, should, you should partake in, in part of the party. But the Olympics were not extremely, they didn't go as expected, because it was, it was all work and no play. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about some themes that you've kind of mentioned today. Sure. It, you know, perseverance seems to be a definition of you, of being told so many times that you're the wrong fit, wrong sport. How do you approach overcoming the, some of the negativity that was brought in and to become you know, one of the, you know, the best in your sports? It's, I, can't, I have two modes. Like, if I'm passionate about something, there's, there's really a zero and a one. I, I'm either off or on. So when I'm on, it's full on. 
if I'm being told that I can't accomplish something, then I'm going to go and accomplish it at, you know, whenever I can. A lot of that is additional self-motivation, like that, that, uh, that commercial from PNG. But for the most part, it's I made a promise to myself to do things in a certain way to achieve certain things. And I, I never actually, that's it's really one promise I never wanted to break. Mm -hmm. With a sport that's so seemingly individualized, how do you look at the teamwork and leadership and different pieces to such a kind of a solo sport? It is a solo sport. So as I mentioned, Skeleton, the athlete qualifies the country, but he's not necessarily the one to go. And so Skeleton is very aggressive in terms of people needing to jump places for uh, to get to where they need to get. Because all of us as Olympic athletes, we we eat, sleep, and, and basically live, we breathe, for this single point four years in the future or eight years in the future, whatever it might be. The Olympics is everything. And so you would do almost anything to get there. The decision to, the decision to sacrifice potential points for myself in order to give Israel a, a bigger chance of qualifying was a really difficult one, but it was the team aspect of it where if you have more people on the different circuits, you can try to cover those bases. So even though it is a solo sport, as somebody who is leading our team, it was my obligation to put in a policy that would help us as a team. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone who's looking to not just become maybe the best athlete in their field, but the best in their field? It's Everybody is different, so it's difficult to dispense very general advice. I'd say that You know, if you set out to actually accomplish something, then there is, there is, I always talk to kids and I usually describe it as there's an opening to your book, there's a beginning to your book. There's a table of contents and that table of contents is not yet written. Then there's an end to your book and we know how the story always ends. The story will end either when we pass on or when we stop, right? And so what happens in between? So you get to write all those pages of what happens in between. Right? So for me, I knew that I started as a skeleton athlete and I was going to finish when I, when I retired as a skeleton athlete. Was there going to be a chapter that was called Olympic Games? Or was there going to be a chapter called The Decision to Quit? And so for me, it was there would never be a chapter called The Decision to Quit. Mm -hmm. So are you trying to qualify for 2022? <laughs> um, I, I wish. Uh, no, not, not actually. It, the, after the Olympics, I kind of took stock of where I was in life. I realized I was 27 years old, and there was more um, there was more potential for fresh blood to come in who were who did have the components of being a far more competitive skeleton athlete. And so I shifted my focus to recruiting a far better athlete than myself to come into the program. So thankfully, after the Olympics, we got a lot of interest in people joining the program. So we have four new athletes in the program itself. And I, am, I coach them because it, when I was doing the sport, I didn't actually have a coach who traveled around with me. It was one of the biggest drawbacks to being not part of a big program is I didn't get that developmental leg up. But for the new athletes in our sport, I get to act as that coach. So I video them on a constant basis. I'm in touch with them almost every single day. And I'm, I'm their liaison to, I mean, that, that has become my new passion project. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of Olympians that struggle post-athletic career. Um, you're now coaching. Uh, what else are you working on, and how have you kind of approached uh, the post-Olympic uh, life? The, the post-Olympic life is a, a difficult transition. I think uh, the effect of coming down from training every day and living, living a mission that it completely defines your life is in, it's just too difficult to describe. It becomes a really big mental health problem to tackle. Right, so, I mean, we call it the Olympic come down. So after the Olympics, you're all hyped up. You've just represented your country, and now it's, now it's all gone. Like, to me, as I described it, felt like, it felt like if somebody was a surgeon and somebody had removed their ability to perform surgery. Right? And so I lost my reason almost for operating. So that, 
it's just difficult to overcome. And it's a continual effort to find passions to replace that, to find opportunities to replace it. So mentoring the new Israeli athletes and making sure that we have a continuing Olympic team, that's something that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. Another thing is I'm looking for a new opportunity in life um, back in tech other or otherwise. So that's where I am right now, building the Israeli team and finding my next opportunity. As a coach, do you ever get the urge to, to go down yes. yourself every yeah. single time? Yeah, in fact, uh, I, told, I told my parents like a couple weeks ago, I was like, okay, that's it, I'm, uh, I'm going back to the sport, I'm going to do bobsled. And, like, um, but you realize that's just like the, that's just the, the, lon the loneliness of not having sport again, that's, that's that talking. That you, you have to make smart decisions, and the smart decision is to be supportive of the new athletes uh, rather than just you know, taking a joy ride again for the next four years. And what's the outlook for the Israeli bobsled team in 2022? Oh, it's, uh, we have these four new athletes. The previous ath the athlete who competed alongside me last year, he's still doing the program, he's still doing the sport, and he is Israel's hope for the 2022 games. The new athletes are hope for the 2026 games, and they're, they're looking incredibly promising, actually. In fact, one is an incredible 100-meter sprinter, and so we have very high hopes for him. I'm also trying to put together a female bobsled team and a female mono bobsled team, uh, which is a very brand new sport. Mono bobsled is just a single person that sits in the side. If, if mono bobsled had been around when I was uh, starting the sport, I definitely would have done mono bob. But the f female version uh, is now out, and so I'm recruiting for that. Awesome. So I do want to open up to audience questions. We're going to have a microphone up there if, um, if anybody wants to ask one. Um, while people line up, uh, I have one kind of fun question for you. What um, the Olympic Village is pretty notorious and pretty famous. Um, what's the best family-friendly story you can share uh, from your time in the Olympic Village? The family-friendly story. So the Olympic Village is our our new homes. It's kind of like living in a dorm room, a pretty packed dorm room at that. Athletes share each each room with each other, there's sometimes three athletes, two rooms, sometimes, very, very rarely does an athlete get a single room. So we're all in close quarters, and we're all with, sometimes with our heads of, of teams, and, and so if you're working on your equipment, you're working on your equipment basically on your dinner table, right, or where, you'd, where you might eat. And so uh, for me, there was actually uh, a story that revolved around my helmet, and uh, my helmet, contained an image of Samson. And Samson is um, a religious figure, so to speak. And so I had to, I was told by the Olympic Committee after I started training with his helmet that I'd have to cover him up. Like, it's against the Olympic Charter to have religious propaganda in, uh, um, on your person. So I ran around Pyeongchang, which is kind of like Nowheresville, looking for a can of spray paint. Right? And I couldn't find this spray paint anywhere, and so I traveled to Gangnun, which is miles away where the figure skaters were living. I find, finally found a can of spray paint, but I then turned our closet into, I turned our closet in our dorm room into this very noxious like spray painting studio where I was taking my helmet and I had a makeshift bandana on and I taped over and I was spray painting over this whole helmet. I never spray painted before. but. Uh, it's, it's something that all these athletes do where they have to modify their equipment, but they're doing it basically like on their tables. Wow. Did we, yeah, we have a question? Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. So um, from my experience, I played like very high caliber competitive tennis growing up. And so I really related to your statement about it being like very individual. So I guess my question is like, how did you reconcile the whole like it's individual and very solo, but at the same time you're playing in a team, and so, but you're still trying to like take each other's places in that sense, and how did you reconcile that fact and like deal with that pressure? It's really hard. It's, um, it's incredibly difficult because when you compete, you're actually also competing, as you know, you're competing with them in the same races, right? So your success comes at their expense, and vice versa. The, how I personally reconciled it was that when I started out, I started out for a mission. That mission was to try to accomplish something where Israel would get to the Olympic Games. I had to keep that mission in perspective that Israel would get to the Olympic Games one way or another, but at the same time, like, 
I believed personally, internally, that I was the only person who could do that. All right, so I took a look. Like, when, I, when I thought I was going to quit in 2016, one of the things that I had said to myself when I decided to unquit like five minutes later was that I'm the only person who can proudly represent us in the way that I want us represented in the Olympics. Like, I have to be the one. And so I'm going to support the rest of my team in trying to get there. But at the same time, I need to be that standard bearer. And so that, it's difficult to reconcile. I, it, I competed in multiple races with the person who was directly challenging me. And so that led to a lot of, it leads to difficult friction. But at the same time, if you believe internally that you are the best suited to, to do it, then it actually removes the component of a them versus you and makes it a you versus the field. Right? So they just become part of that field. And so if I thought that I myself was the best, the best Israeli, then I was really just trying to qualify myself rather than to beat him. Right. Yeah. Hey, AJ, thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, the main thing I'm wondering about is the perseverance. You mentioned that one time that you were especially considering dropping out, um, um, but then you got re-inspired. Um, and so I was just wondering if kind of there were other times where like maybe very frequently you were oscillating about it. Yeah. Um, it just seems very impressive to me to maintain a very continued um, intensity and belief that you can push through. Well, it, it's the, I wanted to quit multiple times. That was the time that I actually decided to quit. So the, the frequency with which, I want, with which I suffered minor burnouts was quite high because of the volume that I was doing and the, the workload that I had sustained. I think the Olympics are, a measure not of not just of this athletic success because there's an immense amount of gifted athletic individuals all over the world and Lord knows I'm far from the most gifted athletic individual um, but most most of qualifying for the Olympics I believe is that it's like this unbroken belief that you can accomplish it and so every time that I wanted to quit which was it was really quite often it was a few times per season usually if there was like a bad injury or, um, or a bad result, then it simply, you know, it, it required, as I mentioned before, the belief that I was the only one who could do this. And so if, if I was the only one who could do it, then I was removing the ability of Israel to, to qualify them. I was actually taking that away from them. And I had promised them that I would give them that ability four years, you know, four years before, two years before. But if I pulled out, it would be stripping them. It would be like stealing. And so I was stealing my potential. I was stealing their potential. And so that's pretty much how I kept um, from straying too far into the uh, quit mindset. Ooh, any other questions? I have, I have one more I want to ask. If you were going to be in the Summer Olympics, what sport would you want to participate in? Oh, weightlifting. Weightlifting. Yeah, I love weightlifting. Lifting big things is like so much fun. So uh, <laughs> we, we, part of our training is, uh, so. Our training is actually, it consists during the summer. A lot of people ask how we train during the summer. During the summer, there's no ice anywhere. Right? And you can only train in skeleton, on a skeleton, on ice at a bobsled track. And bobsled tracks are only built in places that have hosted the Olympics before, because nobody wants to build this $300 million waste of, you know, waste of concrete. So, <laughs> the, uh, and so during the summer, all we do is we lift and we sprint. And so we do these Olympic lifts, these cleans and snatches. And that develops explosive hip movements, and we sprint. And so I spent an immense amount of time in the gym just doing this weightlifting. And at first, I was actually really bad at it. I didn't know how to clean. So it looked like you know, every time the bar would go over the head, it would come. I actually wouldn't be able to hold it. And so it would fall back, and I'd fall back. And it looked, you know, it looked quite pathetic. But over time, over a lot of repetition, it became quite second nature. And so I thought like, if, if I was going to do another Olympic sport, it would probably be weightlifting. So I thank you um, so much. Your story is, you know, really inspiring. You know, um, and um, I'm, I'm originally from Jamaica, so thanks for the cool runnings. Um. I actually <laughs> trained in Jamaica. All right, we yeah. need to talk about that. <laughs> um, but um, two things are like really impressive, like um, your ability to set really stretch goals. Like I'm um, struggling in school, so I'm going to get into it. MIT. 
um, or I'm overweight, I'm going to become an o o Olympian. Like, how do you do that? Like, those are really, <laughs> really um, strong goals. And the, the other question is um, that ad, I, I know the ad, and um, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, if you could speak a little bit about the role your parents played in your yeah, of course. Role experience. My parents are actually here today. Yeah. So, uh, the, <laughs> so a couple of uh, so I'll speak to in order of, of how you asked it, uh, but I'll actually touch on the cool runnings uh, thing first. The uh, every year was a challenge to figure out where I was going to spend my time training, and. There was multiple options. I could train in Israel, uh, which had the advantage of being close to my homeland and very close to the mission at hand. But in the final uh, summer, when it looked like it would be an incredibly difficult push, I didn't know whether I was going to make the games at all during that summer. In fact, it looked pretty doubtful. Um, and so I thought, the, much in line with what you, th what, what you mentioned of stretching goals, I thought, what is the craziest, who are the craziest best sprinters in the world? The craziest best sprinters in the world are Jamaicans. Right, so certainly if I go to Jamaica and learn from a Jamaican coach, they have some t tips and tricks to teach somebody who has absolutely no skill at sprinting how to be a good sprinter. Right, so I went to, uh, I hooked up with my Jamaican bobsled friends. And I said, I said, do you guys have a good coach? Like, do you have a coach somewhere? And they said, yeah, man. Like, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we can hook you up with this guy in Spanish town uh, right inside of Kingston, and, and you'll stay with him. He's a great coach. And, uh, and so I did. I went down there, and I trained, and, and that was, you know, it, it was actually an incredibly difficult uh, summer for me because on top of the heat, uh, a lot of times we lacked running water, and I was, it was not, Spanish town is not the safest place for me. And, um, but it was an incredible experience. Speaking to why going to the extremes, I feel that if, like, if you're going to test what we, in engineering, you guys are all engineers, so you know boundary conditions, right? So for me, it was about testing ranges and boundary conditions. I wanted to always go to the extreme. If I wanted to do something, I wanted to do it to the utmost best ability. Right? And so there was no point in doing anything other than that. All right? So no, I, I don't think anybody starts out and says, you know what, I, I want to be the 35,000th ranked chess player in the world, right? They want to be the best, right? It, it, in the meantime, they'll settle in at a certain rank, but they want to be the best. So, uh, so for me, if I wasn't doing, if I didn't have any academic goals, what was the number one academic goal? Get into MIT. If I wanted to be accomplished in sport, the number one way to do that was by going to the Olympic Games. Um, in terms of uh, my parents who supported me, uh, they supported me in multiple ways. The first uh, is emotional. They were incredibly uh, supportive of the journey. I think uh, it's very difficult for parents who know that their child has um, the potential to accomplish something in a more established industry and something a little more certain. You know, it, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, certainly they didn't know when I started uh, my time at MIT that after graduating from MIT, I would actually just drop everything and go and do sports. And so I think it came as a bit of shock to them, but they were incredibly supportive of it. And so that I appreciate their support every day. It was in incredible. Uh, number two was um, when I cut the supply line to Oracle, this was one of the extremes that I did when I left Oracle. When I decided to stay in the sport and to make 2018, the number one way of doing that, I thought, was cutting off all lifelines to my previous life. Whereas in during that season, I always thought, well, if this doesn't work out, I can go back to a really nice salary and a very comfortable living in California. Like, it's available to me. The job's there. I'm supposed to go back there in the summer. When I decided to not quit, um, I thought that the number one way to stay on track was by s not by completely burning the bridge, but removing that potential. I, I, I could no longer go back to that job. Right, and so that involved removing a source of income. And so um, skeleton is very expensive. And thankfully, uh, my parents supported, uh, helped support me on the rest of my journey. And it, without them, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. Uh, but you know, I'm incredibly thankful to them. They're, they played a huge part. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing your experience. Uh, could you talk about the role of religion in your uh, 
Olympic story and how did that play just on a day-to-day -day basis and whatnot? Sure. Uh, religion was it, religion defined who I was as as an athlete because I was competing on behalf of a community. So I developed uh, one of the things that I learned early on from somebody who was a sports psychologist was that you need to center yourself before a competition. So you need to always go back to a specific marker so that you know where you are. And so that to me was a saying, it was a mantra. And so the mantra I came up with was for myself, for my people, and for my country. So I was representing the country of Israel, but I was representing the people of, uh, I was representing these, the, the people of Israel, the you know, Jewish people, as, as well as their non-Jewish non Israelis, but I was representing them. But I wore a kippah. I wore, everywhere I, I went, I wore a kippah. So the, when the directive came, a few years ago, the directive came from the Israeli um, security personnel that the guidelines for Israeli athletes was because it was quite dangerous for Israeli athletes to travel, especially in Europe, while wearing Israeli gear, that we were not to travel outside of competition venue with markings of an Israeli athlete, um, including potentially kippot. So which, this is a kippah. And, uh, and so instead of actually removing that, I, I went to the extreme and ordered a full kit of gear of a shirt that said Israeli bobsled and skeleton team, pants which said uh, Israeli bobsled and skeleton team, and jackets which said Israeli bobsled and skeleton team. That way, every time I was walking around on a plane, it would start a conversation, oh, Israel has a bobsled and skeleton team. So that, to me, it was, it was a central part of my identity. And it, it, it helped motivate me further. Well, AJ, thank you for being here. Yeah. Let's give a round of applause.